Hey everybody, it's Felisa. This is going to be another entry into Spotlight Sunday where I highlight cases of the missing, lost, and endangered. This case is going to be uh, a departure from my usual presentation of African American women, as this concerns an entire family that went missing from Chicago, Illinois on July the 5th, 1996. This is the case of the Thompson family. Everett Thompson Sr. has been missing from Chicago, Illinois since July the 5th, 1996. His classification is in danger of missing. His date of birth is listed as March the 12th, 1956. He will be 63 years old today. At the time he went missing, he was 40. His height and weight is listed as six feet tall, 250 pounds, black hair, brown eyes, and he may have a mustache. Everett owned the Eat restaurant in the Park Manor neighborhood of the city. He and his wife, Lydia, lived with their three children, Andrew and Everett Jr. in the 8100 block of South Roads Avenue. Lydia Thompson is listed as being 43 years old at the time of her disappearance. Her date of birth is listed as September the 12th, 1952, and she would be 67 years old today. Her height and weight is given as 5'8", 135 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, and she has a large vaccination scar on her upper arm. She may also use her maiden name as White. Her son Andrew is listed as being eight years old at the time of his disappearance. His date of birth is April the 4th, 1988. He was four feet seven, 80 pounds when he disappeared. Ever Jr. is listed as 11 years old at the time that he disappeared. His date of birth is June 22nd, 1985. He would be 35, 34 years old today. He was five feet tall, 90 pounds, and black hair, brown eyes. The details of the disappearance are as follows. Uh, the Thompsons were seen last in their home on July the 5th, 1996 in their hometown of Chicago, Illinois. Everett Thompson Sr. owned the Eat and Company restaurant in the Park Manor neighborhood of the city and they lived in the 8100 block of South Rose Avenue at the time of their disappearance. Lydia's brother, Kenneth White, had moved in with the Thompsons in February 1996 after his release from prison. He served a term for rape. The Thompson home had been Lydia's father, and he passed it on to his three children, each held a one-third share in the property. The Thompson family was unhappy about White's presence in the home, and, and Everett's side of the family referred to him as a freeloading house guest. On July the 3rd, about four months after White moved in, Lydia called 911 to report that he had threatened to kill her with an axe. Police responded to the scene, but the dispute had died down by the time that they arrived and they left without making any arrests. On July the 5th, Everett's father called him at work, and the conversation was normal, but in the middle of it, Lydia called her husband frantic and begged him to come home immediately. She said that Kenneth had chased her around the house with an axe and that she had locked herself in the bedroom. Everett told her his father about what had happened, ended their conversation, and left the restaurant. One of his employees was the last person to see him alive. Two hours later, White arrived at the restaurant driving Everett's van. He told the manager that Everett had been arrested after a car accident and then left. White was wearing white sneakers, and the manager noted red smears on them. Twelve days later, on July 17th, Everett's parents asked the police to check on the family as no one could get in touch with them. The police went to the Thompson home and found only White, who said that his sister and her family were fine and they had taken an impromptu vacation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where Everett was born and where his parents lived. The police could find no evidence of foul play and the Thompson's van was missing, which supported White's story. They left without investigating further. Over the next few weeks, White told various versions of the impromptu vacation story to people, variously claiming that the Thompsons took a, bu a bus to Philadelphia and that they took a bus to Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, or that they went to Hawaii. White was driving the Thompsons' van when he was arrested for falsifying Lydia's signature on a check, but the police didn't realize this contradicted his earlier statement to them. In late July, Everett's parents traveled to Chicago and tried to find the family, investigating on their own and speaking to employees of the Eden Company, but their efforts were unsuccessful. They asked the police to investigate further, 
The restaurant manager told the police about White's statement the day they last saw Everett, but there was no record of Everett getting arrested or being associated with a traffic accident. Authorities learned that in the Thompson's absence, Kenneth had forged Lydia's and his other sister's signature on documents to sell their home. An inspector visited the house before the sale was made and noticed that one toilet and one bathtub had recently been painted red and the kitchen floor had been torn out. These changes had been made sometime after the police visited the home on July the 3rd as they had examined the house and the kitchen floor had been fine and there were no, ba there were no red bathroom fixtures. By the time the police uncovered the illegal sale, the new owners had already had the house gutted for renovation. The police interviewed White several times but did not have probable cause to arrest him. He moved to a trailer in Gary, Indiana in July 1997 and the FBI searched in and around his trailer and found a pair of men's gym shoes and a boy's sock, both bloodstained. In November 1997, he was arrested for failure to register as a sex offender. He was released but was arrested again the following month for bank fraud. He had allegedly forged Lydia's name on a check for over $13,000. In a court hearing about the bank fraud, the prosecutor claimed White axe murdered the Thompson family. The theory was that White wanted the Thompson home to himself and murder his sister and her husband and children in order to get it. On Christmas Day, 1997, White hanged himself in jail. He did not leave a note, and before his death, he did not re reveal any possible information he may have concealed regarding the Thompson's cases. Investigators believe White probably murdered the Thompson's on July 5th or 6th, but they never found enough evidence to charge him, and searches of both White's home and Gary and the Thompson's home in Chicago turned up no sign of human remains. So that information came directly from the Charlie Project. And, you know, I just have several concerns about this timeline. Um, first of all, you know, the last time that anyone spoke or saw, that, saw Everett was on July the 5th. Um, Dad spoke to him on that day. He abruptly got off the phone. And it wasn't until 12 days later that anyone thought to call the police. So I'm not quite sure why there was a delay in time. You know, if someone frantically gets off the phone, mentions to you that, you know, there is, you know, my wife is being chased by an ax, you know, by a, a, someone with an ax and intending to do bodily harm, and then I can't reach you for, you know, the next few hours, let alone several days, you know, I'm, I'm really gonna call the police. Furthermore, you know, to have someone show up driving, you know, these people's car and say, oh, you know, he's been arrested as if that kind of makes sense. And then to have people go, you know, almost two weeks without ever thinking that something was really wrong with this whole scenario. Like, was the restaurant still open? Were they shut down? You know, were they like waiting for further information? Like, that's all very baffling to me. And then the idea that this man literally sold the house that, you know, they were living in, pocketed the proceeds, like where was this other sister? Maybe she was out of town and didn't realize that this is what, ha what was happening, especially if she thought that Lydia was living in this house with her family. Like, you know, maybe she wouldn't be checking records or, you know, even get notification that there was a sale pending or um, that a sale had occurred. Um, but even still, you know, you have someone who just is able to sell a house and then he assumedly packs up whatever his belongings are and then moves but in his new house some you know in a full state away once it's searched they find you know these this bloody sock and this bloody shoe and all this kind of stuff and you know if that's the case that they ever type it did they ever you know send it for dna processing you know to get a, a blood type on this these items and you know if so did it you know what did it come back as was it possibly a match for one of the children was it possibly a match for one of the adults you know that's just so bizarre to me that there's no further follow-up in terms of what the police did with this quote-unquote evidence that they found then you know to know that the family went missing in 1996 you know in July 
And, you know, they he decided that he was going to die by suicide, you know, the, the next year. So this full year has gone past and no one has seen this family. No one has heard from them. You know, of course, we're assuming that there was no activity on their bank accounts other, other than the fraudulent um, activity that Kenneth probably indulged in. But where in the world do you put four bodies? Where in the world do you put four human beings? Um You know, I I would tend to think that if I were a betting woman that, you know, their their remains would be somewhere in that house because it would be very difficult to transport four um, bodies and then dispose of them in a way that they're never found. Um, But, and again, I don't know if there was anything in the van, but, you know, if he was by himself, it would be very difficult to do that. So my money would be that he because he was renovating and tearing up things in the house that, you know, he would have tried to dispose of their remains that way. But the people that bought the house also gutted it and was going through renovations. And so you would think that if there was something there, um, then those remains would be found. This is just baffling. You know, it's just, you know, you have an entire family who went missing um and no one has heard anything from them for you know these past 20 some odd years and you know they just literally have disappeared off of the face of the earth and the one person that will be able to give any information or any insight into what may have happened to them is he himself deceased there is a case with the Doe Network, and the case file is 1510DMIL. I just wanted to give that, um, you know, in case anybody wanted to reference it. Uh, and, you know, of course, the idea that Kenneth contradicted himself, and, you know, I, I find it comical that, you know, nobody realized that he had contradicted himself because he said that the family had first driven out of town with the van, but yet he was seen driving it much later and I did read um an article where you know the prosecution once he was once it was found that he had forged these signatures um the state filed a case against him and it doesn't really say how they came to be aware that the the signatures and the documents were forged Um, But there was a case that was brought against him, hence the reason that he was in jail. And, you know, I was reading that the prosecutor or the prosecution tried to tie in um, that with, you know, this presumably murder case. And, um, you know, the defense took umbrage at that and saying, you know, I've never seen an embezzlement case turn into a murder case. But, you know, I, I, again, I'm, I, first of all, I want to show that I'm not a lawyer, but if I had to guess, you know, I would be thinking that this was cause, that this was establishing motive, you know, for Kenneth to want to get the family out the way so that he could sell the house and pocket all of the shares of the sale. Um, yeah, so this case, again, like I said, is just baffling and it is full of not twists and turns, but, you know, information because there's not a lot out there after Kenneth went home and I'd have to assume that the children were at home with mom. Um, when Kenneth went home, I'm not Kenneth, when Everett went home to check on Lydia since she'd called him, you know, I do wonder, did she place another call to 911 or was she thinking that this was pretty much like, the incident that had occurred a couple of days before where he was doing this and by having Everett come to the house, it would diffuse the situation. I'm pretty sure that she didn't call him home to die. You know, I'm sure that she called him thinking that having him be present would, you know, kind of deescalate things and they could get kind of stabilized. Um, I do think that what probably happened is, you know, she called Everett, she locked herself in the bedroom or the bathroom, excuse me, um, waiting for Everett to come. I believe with my whole heart that in that time, Kenneth probably murdered the boys. Um, and when Everett got home, 
you know, he murdered him, probably ambushed him as he walked into the house. And then the only one that was left was Lydia. And so, you know, when he was able to get to her finally or coax her out of the bathroom or whatever he did, you know, he probably murdered her as well. And the, the most bizarre thing and the baffling thing to this entire puzzle is what did he do with the bodies? Um, because he would have had to have been extraordinarily skilled and uh, adept at concealing and, you know, um, placing them somewhere, but you had four. So, you know, perhaps he, he put them somewhere individually, you know, and it may be that he hid them in plain sight and, you know, people just didn't realize that, you know, it was either a corpse or, you know, just didn't realize that, you know, something was amiss. Either way, you know, of course, and I do try and, and stay away from speculation. Um, however, the merits of this case are just so, like I said, bizarre and just baffling um, as to, you know, it's, it's hard enough to fathom when one person goes missing, but, you know, an entire family, um, an entire household, children and all, and, you know, you have evidence that turns up miles away from the supposed crime scene, you know, in a completely different area. Like, why would you move to a completely different location with the evidence? Like, that does not that makes zero sense. And that's one of the things that's, that's most baffling. Um, and then where did they find this evidence? You know, was it out in the open somewhere? Did they get a search warrant? Did they go in and look for this? Was it packed away? Um, did they search the van? Was there anything in the van that could have lent itself to, you know, giving some insight into this case? It's all very, very, very bizarre. At any rate, um, I do welcome your commentary and your feedback. Uh, if you have any information on the Thompson family and their whereabouts, you're encouraged to call the Chicago Police Department at 312-433-7007 or 312-747-6222. Sources of information for this case today comes from, of course, the charlieproject.org but also from the Doe Network and from the Chicago Tribu Tribune. <sighs> As always, I pray for, you know, those that are affected by this case, particularly the Thompson family. And it is always my hope and my desire that I can present these cases in a humane way that will inspire or cause people to recall information that may be helpful in order to locate these lost and missing people. I ask that you say a prayer for their family, for their loved ones, and even for them, because it is beyond time to bring this family home. Y'all be blessed. Bye.